Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Well, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. It is Monday, a brand new week, and it is, that's crazy as it sounds, the last week of April, be May, on Wednesday. Hopefully the Pelicans will still be playing basketball. They have to win tonight. It is a win or go home for the Pels as they take on the Oklahoma City Thunder in game four at 730 tonight. We bring in Jim Eichenhoff for NewOrleansPelicans.com. We got a lot to discuss here because a lot of things have happened over the weekend. Look, first and foremost, a lot has happened in New Orleans over the weekend. Uh, I, we saw photos, I think, of you on Jazz Fest. You were stage diving. You somehow <laughs> streaked on the 18th fairway when Rory McIlroy was trying to win. These are a classic <laughs> of New Orleans. I think you walked in and stole two pizzas from the media crew that were covering the Saints draft as well. You had a very busy weekend. And oh, by the way, there wow. was three on Saturday. I didn't realize I was the Forrest Gump of this weekend in New Orleans that I was at every single event at- possible. No, <laughs> I'll say what I always say to hosts in the past is if only I could live the life that you've envisioned for me. But yeah, no, I was actually grinding at the Smoothie King Center on Saturday. Then I was grinding at practice in Metairie. So was a little tied up with other events, but amazingly, I was still able to make appearances at all the other ones as well. It's 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 crazy like that. that that's why you are a legend, not only in your own <laughs> right, but in my own mind. Um, Jim, <laughs> one of the other things uh, that we did see over the weekend, obviously, was another Thunder win. And, and look, we can go down and break down um, what they're specifically doing, what the Pels wished it could be doing a little bit better. But I think it my, my overall sense of what I've seen through three games is I'm not surprised in this. You and I have spoken throughout the season. They are the number one seed for a reason. They know what they're doing. They're good defensively. They got guys that can make shots. They got guys that can make threes. They're a tough team to beat. And if you commit turnovers, if you miss shots, you're making it so hard on yourself to try to beat a team that really doesn't beat themselves, Jim. This is a team that has played in a ton of close games this year. They're one of the better teams in clutch time. They're not going to change in the postseason. This is who they are. You have to beat them, and it starts by not beating yourself. Did I just kind of summarize the first three games of this te- no, other, I, the series? I think you did very accurately. I mean, I think if you ask the Thunder to be honest about the way that they've performed in the first three games, if they were to grade – for example, their offensive performance so far, they'd probably say, you know, B minus C plus. We've been okay offensively. But I think it's kind of, I want to say, shocking to see the way that the Pelicans' offense has played against OKC's defense. And we knew going into the series that the Thunder were fourth in the NBA in defensive efficiency. The Pelicans were sixth. But combined with the way that the Thunder have been so effective defensively and honestly just how poor the Pelicans have been at that end of the floor. It's it's hard to believe if you go back over the course of the season and see the way that the Pelicans have been held. You know, they scored 85 points on Saturday. They had 92 points in both game one and game two. It's been by far the biggest problem so far is that the combination of not being able to make shots and turning the ball over has just made it so hard for them to generate offense. And even with the scores coming down, I think mostly – Across the NBA during the playoffs, I mean, you're just not going to be able to win when you score 92, 92, and 85 in the first three games of a series. The most surprising aspect of it, because look, I mean, obviously we can sit there in each game and think, what are the adjustments? What do you need to do? It, it does just come down to what JD says all the time on the broadcast, huh, Jim? It's a make or miss league. If you knock down the shots, this is a different series. The shots are there. You were at practice yesterday. Willie Green said that after practice. They, they're there. You just have to make the shots. Yeah, and he mentioned, too, that I think after the game Saturday, and maybe he alluded to this a little bit Sunday practice, too, that it just seems like they've lost some confidence in their shooting, which is definitely something that we didn't expect. I mean, Larry Nance also talked about this Sunday after practice that they were the fourth best team in the NBA in three-point percentage during the regular season, but they've been near the bottom in the playoffs and it's basically like a 10% difference between 
how they shot in the regular season and how they've done in these first three games against OKC. Now, do you you have to give the Thunder some of the recognition for, you know, you're not going to, you're probably not going to shoot as well against a really good defense as what you did during the regular season when you're playing some of the bottom tier teams and it's a mixture of the entire rest of the NBA as opposed to one opponent. But still, that part of it has been perplexing. I do think to some extent too that, we're seeing something that we talked about here and now and then during the regular season, which is that three point shooting fluctuates Yeah, and over a small sample. I mean, some, sometimes this happens. I mean, Denver is actually shooting threes very poorly in the playoffs as well, but they've been able to overcome that pretty easily by doing well in so many other areas. The Pelicans, it's not just that they're shooting threes poorly and in general bad as well. They're, they only shot 38% from the field on Saturday it's that they're not doing well in a bunch of other areas as well. So you add that together and you have really one of the three games so far they had a chance to win. And these last two have been ended up being pretty one-sided. So I guess one of the, I was going to ask you what adjustments you make for tonight's game four. I I guess it's just go out there and do what you've done all season. You just have to make those shots and and obviously understand that there, there is no tomorrow, right? I mean, we don't get to Wednesday, Jim, if you don't win tonight. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that they're going to have to change too that is under their control is assist to turnover ratio. Like, I think they have to not make as many risky passes, not throw as many passes into traffic. Mm-hmm. I feel like some of the turnovers have been avoidable, and I don't know if it's because they're pressing, because kind of on the same along the same lines of that they they feel pressure to make shots and that they've lost a little confidence in that area. Maybe they feel like they have to be more aggressive offensively to to score more points, but that, that part of it has been really costly. And I mean, the fact that two games in a row, they've had more turnovers than assists is also something that is really impossible to overcome. So in terms of adjustments, I feel like just be more careful on with the ball on offense, protect yeah. the ball. Don't take as many risks with, especially your passes, but also, I mean, they pretty much have to just leave everything on the court tonight too. And play this game. Like it's your last, because it might be your last of this season. So Um, I think they're going to have to just win all of the hustle areas. There's been times in this series where Oklahoma city to me has had a big edge in the hustle plays in the 50, 50 balls. And you, you cannot let that happen tonight with, you know, the season hanging in the balance. Yeah, no doubt. And and Jim, obviously one of the things we're going to discuss in more detail here coming up in the next segment is what we've seen so far in the postseason, you and I swore we're going to see six, seven game series in the Western yeah. Conference. What's going on in the East here as well. And it's always interesting how some of the things we may feel during the regular season, are they coming to fruition in the postseason or not? And obviously once the season ends for a lot of different teams, the Phoenix Suns got pieced out as they got swept last night here as well. And they have to decide what to do. Everyone's going to be looking at how you change, how you get better. And I think you and I agree. Are we seeing a changing of the guard or a changing of ways, perhaps, in the NBA? We'll we'll delve into that here when we come back. Stay with us here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. All right, welcome back. Gus Kattengill, Jim Eikenhofer. Jim, I look around the Western Conference playoffs. Obviously, the Pels and Thunder is one series. But what else is standing out to you when you look at this postseason, not just in the West, but maybe even in the East? Yeah, I mean, I think... In the West, to me, you know, you mentioned earlier the fact that the Timberwolves Sun series is already over with Minnesota sweeping that. To me, there's so many lessons from that series, just in specifically. I mean, for one thing, you know, we talked about this over the course of the regular season. You know, you you've mentioned how I like to lean on the phrase body of work, how I think that that's important. And it's it's funny because with the Sun specifically, I think there's so many people around the NBA media people who said, you know, they're going to be fine when it gets to the playoffs. You know, they might not look good. They might not have been consistent through the regular season, but they have Kevin Durant, they have Devin Booker, they have Bradley Beal. And it's like, okay, when the playoffs start, they're going to be able to become a totally different team. And as we've seen, that doesn't work. And I think in some ways too, that we've been, we've been fooled a little bit by, for example, what the Miami Heat did last year, where they got in as a play, play in team, they barely made the playoffs and then they end up all the way in the NBA finals. So I'm not saying it's not possible to, you know, kind of click into gear and suddenly become a team that's dangerous after you've been pretty mediocre during the season. But I think if you looked over the course of NBA history or even the last 10, 15 years, 
you'd see that what happened to Phoenix in the playoffs is much more common than what Miami did. Um, you, you're not going to be able to all of a sudden change your habits. If you're a team that doesn't move the ball, you're not going to suddenly in the playoffs be able to do it. If you don't defend all season, you're not going to be able to do that either. So to no, me, does it work like that? Right, right exactly. <laughs> so to me, it's like my popular, my favorite phrase of, of body of work has definitely come into play to a, a big extent, especially in that series. So, I mean, the other thing too, Gus, is specifically to the West, one of the observations that I would make so far is, you know, like you said, I totally agree with you. I thought all these first round series were going to be six or seven games. We were going to see amazing basketball. But in some ways, I feel like that, obviously this is in hindsight, that we might have discounted what it takes to be a 57-win team in the West, the way Oklahoma City is the way Minnesota got to that level, the way Denver, I feel like a lot of times when we talked about those three teams, especially Minnesota and Oklahoma city, it was a little bit discounted. Like, you know, they're new teams. They've, they won, yeah, they won more games than the pack of teams beneath them in the West, yeah. but it wasn't that big of a margin. But I mean, based on the playoffs so far, we're seeing that there is a huge difference between winning 55 to 57 games and winning high forties, the way that, the Suns and the Pelicans did. Um, I Those teams have just shown like what they put on the floor all season has carried over into the regular season. And, and, and obviously the, these matchups have been uh, more one-sided than we expected. And I think you have to say that these teams consistently throughout the regular season showed that they were the best teams in the West and now they're proving it in the first round of the playoffs. It's interesting, too, as well, and I was watching the end of that Minnesota game last night, Jim, and listening to Anthony Edwards postgame with Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, they look like BFFs, you know, and and mm -hmm. but the thing is, too, and it's something to look at. Look, I keep using the analogy on my talk show as well. I'm seeing a shift and a change in the NFL in that. You know, you you had this this stretch of let's go get that quarterback or top player, pay them that money, especially a quarterback, though. But the going rate for what's coming, and there was a lot of speculation that Jordan loves contract, the quarterback for the Packers. Like, remember when Drew Brees was 20? Now we're looking at 60 million, right? For him, possibly, mm -hmm. or 50 to mm -hmm. 60, Dak Prescott, all that. Anyway, bottom line is teams want to win with their rookie quarterback while he's in that rookie contract mm -hmm. and spend the money on skilled players, defensive players, whatever. But that four or five year window after drafting a young player and building it that I, I'm seeing that shift there. Are we seeing that a little bit in the NBA? Cause when I listen to Anthony Edwards, I thought it was very insightful. And, and you look at Chris Finch in his time there and Carl Anthony towns, right? He was drafted to be the guy there. And then they, they, they bring in Anthony Edwards. He had to accept that role with Anthony Edwards. But listening to him yesterday say, hey, my second year finally took me to understand I need to trust the coach. He's telling me what to do, and it's hard for me to say I don't want to do that if when I do it, it works. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to hear them say that because right now we're seeing it. Right now we're seeing Anthony Edwards in a side-by-side -side split video somebody posted on Twitter of him and Michael Jordan dunking on the Suns. We're, but we're seeing a work. Not in progress. We're seeing four years of work. It's hard to think about it like that. But mm -hmm. Jim, to hear him say, two years ago is when I began to trust my coach. And I earned his trust and he earned my trust. Two years later, you're seeing him, right, where he is now. But that's a four-year thing. That's four years of playoffs. That's four years of win-losses. That's four years of playing. That's four years of not being in the postseason, in and out. And I think that's the thing that I'm focusing and being key on here when I look at where the Pels are, where Zion is, and where some of the other teams are. Same thing with OKC. A lot of their draft picks with SGA, they've been playing together for a sure. while. They took yeah. beatings, you know. They yep. and so I, I I don't know. Am I seeing a shift perhaps in the, in the NBA when I look at the Suns? They got 116 million in luxury mm -hmm. tax money that's that's already committed for next year, no matter what they do. Right. Like that, and, and you didn't get out of the first round. So I I don't know. I almost feel like I, not not to say the, the phrase you know trust the process or steady the course, but I, I think we're we're seeing again building with. With 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 youth and making the right picks and developing players, and, and then 
go out there and gain that experience. Because I, I look at Minnesota and I look at them. Same thing with Denver, Jim. You look at mm -hmm. the Nuggets up and down. Right. They didn't they, really go out patient. there and buy, mm -hmm. you know, those players. Yep. It's they develop themselves. So the top three teams in the West that have looked the best in the postseason are all in-house built. Am I right? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, I think in all of those cases, they've let things kind of marinate a little bit. I mean, I think the Timberwolves are a little bit more of a, you know, they traded for Rudy Gobert and it's been more, a little bit more of a short term thing as far as the top of the roster. But like you said, Anthony Edwards and Towns have both been there together for multiple seasons. And I mean, I think you see such a difference in the teams that have been together for multiple years with their key guys, as opposed to Phoenix, where it was kind of just thrown together and they, they tried to get the best possible talent and players and scores that they could get. But then there's two problems with that. One, you have no money left to spend. And two, a lot of times you don't, you have only that part of the, the need is filled. Like, okay, mm -hmm. we have enough offense. We have enough individual scores, but all these other areas we're struggling in and we're lacking in. And it's hard to figure out how to fill those gaps when you can't, when you, you have eaten up all of your salary cap on your, your top couple guys, but you know, one of the words that you used that I think is so important, and you can see this if you watch a lot of the matchups in the West so far, the word that you used was trust. Yeah. And to me, it's it's beyond it's not just the trust between, you know, a co a player and a coach, the way that you described with Anthony Edwards. A lot of it is the trust that you have between players on on the same team. You know, do I trust a guy to make an open shot? Do I trust a guy to play help defense? And a lot of that stuff takes a couple of years to get developed. It's not something that can happen, you know, if you make a trade in February and you expect by April that you're going to have all that stuff in place. It doesn't right. work that way. And I think for – we're seeing that with Oklahoma City as well. And I think to to turn it back to the Pelicans a little bit too, I feel like they're they're in that process towards getting there, but obviously they're not there. They're not where Oklahoma City and Memphis or Minnesota are in terms of chemistry. And if you just watch, you watch the Timberwolves Sun series, you see one team that is very connected, has a lot of co cohesiveness and chemistry, and you have another team where it looks like the guys, even though we're 80 something games in the season, they look like they've never played together yeah. before. Well, I mean, so, it's crazy. You listen to the post games, and not to interrupt you, but Devin no, Booker's good. talking about the details. Kevin Durant's talking about they didn't like the way that he, he used the offense. He's in the corner too much. He's not, you're absolutely right. It's discombobulated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, just looking left and right on my timeline. I mean, it's all kind of people that um that think changes are coming there. So yeah, to, to your point though, it's the continuity and the trust factor. And I think that's the thing that we've talked about even at an opening segment and through this series. The Pels are making the right plays. The shots just have to go down, right? And that confidence comes from the shots going down. And you, you do have players that played in that series, but even Brandon Ingram was asked on on Saturday, the difference between that Sun series and this series here now. And yeah. it is different when you look at it, right? Because you would think you have a collection of guys that play together as well and yeah. as long. And it just, it, it literally, come, I don't know, I guess it yeah. comes down to shot making. I think the interesting thing for Brandon, too, is like, I, I don't think he's going to be somebody who comes out and says, I'm injured still and I'm not 100%. And that's not, and that's why I'm not playing well. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder a little bit how close to 100% he is just based on the fact that he has looked so different. I mean, I think Lou Dort's defense definitely is part of why he's struggled so much, but um, yeah, it's hard. It is hard to explain the difference beyond the, obviously they don't have Zion, but they didn't have Zion two years ago in the playoffs either. The difference between the way that they've performed in this series and the way they played against Phoenix two years ago with basically a lot of the same players. But I mean, one thing that Willie green mentioned and, and was asked about, after game three Saturday was, does he like the shot selection? And he said, basically like a lot of the shots that we've taken have been good, but there's been some ones that have been not so good or questionable. And I do think that there have been times where you have to go back to remembering that you almost won 50 games during the regular season. And that a big reason why that happened was because you had contributions from so many different players. Yeah. It, it doesn't need to be on one or two guys or three guys to say, I need to get 40 for us to win tonight. And so in addition to the turnovers and the poor shooting, 
I think it's so hard too when you're shooting poorly to get out of a slump by taking tough shots. Like it's just not going to happen. To me, there needs to be a ratio between the difficulty of a guy's shots should be commensurate to how well they're shooting. So if Trey Mur Murphy may takes a couple 35 footers, it's because he has got already made like five threes in that game. Yeah. And I feel like what, what we're seeing sometimes and I mean, his shot attempts have gone down, so it's not, I'm not talking about him, but I feel like what we're seeing sometimes is like the more we struggle on offense, the more we're taking difficult shots and trying to do things by, by ourselves. And it's like everybody who's watched basketball knows that that's exactly the wrong thing to do is to try to be like more like, it's going to be me. I'm going to go yeah. one on five. I'm going to try to, to cut into the defense. I'm going to try to take off balance jumpers, even though I haven't been shooting well. So I think that's another problem that's been part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, look, we'll, we'll see what happens. And I almost feel like th I felt this way after game one, two, even now as we're looking at it, three, Jim, it's, I just feel like what if they can just get that win and get that confidence and free flowing again. And all of a sudden just, you know, put a little pressure on the other side of things, right? Which when it comes to pressure, we'll talk about that. We come back to the rest of the Western Conference playoffs, including the action today with Jim Eikenhofer. All right, Jim, Thunder and Pels, they'll tip off tonight at 7.30. An hour before that, though, this is an interesting game. You got the Celtics in the heat. This is a 2-1 series now. If somehow Miami wins this, right? I mean, you want to talk about pressure because Boston won 64 games this year. Like, they, they are the team that everyone's already kind of started to fit for the belt, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they look the best. Sure. They, they've they made the moves. Uh, they, they are well ahead of the process. You know, they, this, I mean, it's only about winning a title now for them at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and look, you, you don't need Jimmy coming back. Right. I'll think at right. some point and mm -hmm. say a game six or seven or something. But Jim, I, I know it's, this is going to be an interesting one. How much pressure is on Boston tonight to win this game? Yeah, I think there's some, you know, to me, one of the biggest takeaways from that series, the first three games so far is, you know, I mentioned how three point shooting can fluctuate and how volatile it can be. I mean, the heat made 23 threes in game two, then they come back in game three. They can't make a shot. They play <laughs> poorly. They're down by 30 something points. And I mean, maybe this is me base, basing this on just how much better Boston was during the regular season than Miami. But I just think that game two was kind of a fluke where one of the teams got really hot from three point range. And so, I mean, could the heat do that again? Possibly. But I feel like if you're Boston, you're a lot more, you feel a lot better about things after game three that you kind of restored order. But I mean, it's just, it's become part of the NBA where it's like, you don't know from night to night if a team is going to be ice cold from three point range, or if they're going to make everything. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, you could take a team that wasn't even, didn't even make the playoffs this year. And if they shoot 50% from three point range and they take 45 threes, they got a really good chance to beat almost anyone. So I, I feel like, you know, that's part of what's happened, but I'm not big on predictions, but I do honestly feel a little bit like Boston's going to just win, win out now and they'll take care of them tonight. And, of course, I said that last year with Milwaukee against Miami in the first round, too. And right. we, we saw how that went. Well, it was a good thing that you were, you know, well, what are you doing? Stage diving at Jazz Fest, stealing pizzas from the media room in the Saints uh, draft room over the weekend. You stormed the course at the Zurich Classic mm -hmm. and covered Thunder Pell's game three. So that kept you busy enough to where you didn't see the Lakers win. Game four. <laughs> it is still a 3 1 Nugget series tonight in Denver, nine o'clock over on TNT. Um, are, are they going to Cancun, the Lakers tonight? I would think so. I mean, I, I give them credit for the fact that they showed up in game four and they showed pride and didn't get, get swept. We're going to hope to see the exact same thing from the Pelicans tonight. Right. You know, a lot of people say when a team's down 3 0 that, you know, it's time to just give up because no team in NBA history has ever come back from that. But I mean, there's definitely some pride element to not getting swept. And I mean, Phoenix, would it have mattered if Phoenix lost that series 4-1 or 4-0? Maybe, maybe not. But I mean, to me, going into the offseason the way that they did is definitely something that kind of eats away at you a little bit more that you weren't able to get one win. So, but I think that I think Denver, especially at home tonight, will be able to close that out and I mean, you're talking to me, Gus. I'm not going to say that I'm expecting the Lakers to be <laughs> amazing. So, 
No, I, I understand fully for here as well. Well, hopefully, sir, we'll be talking about a game five in OKC. And look, again, Pelicans are, were the best road team of the season. I, I just feel like got to get this win, get this, you know, this. I wouldn't even call it a monkey off their back. Just get get going again. Get those good vibes because, Jim, this almost feels very similar to when they went one and five here at home. They went on a road, yeah. got that win, and they played well, and you saw the confidence this team can play with. I feel like that that like that tonight. Then go out there, get the SKC going get some threes to go down, get some momentum going, head on up to OKC and play loose. You got nothing to lose. You'll be down three, one. So I just feel like that can, that can really help them a bit. And and as much as things look bleak right now in terms of, you know, they're down three Oh, they haven't played well. It's definitely not in the last two games. I mean, there is a list that you could come up with of reasons why they can win tonight. And I mean, three point shooting is, is definitely on there somewhere with, mm-hmm. I just feel like they're due that, that they're, you would think they wouldn't have three games in a row where they've shot as poorly as they have and definitely not four in a row. So, I mean, there's that, there's also the possibility of to me, CJ, BI and Trey all are capable of having a huge game on any, on any given night. So um, maybe one or two of those things will happen and you'll have a lot better chance. I mean, if all of a sudden they go from the almost probably the worst three point shooting they've had all season back to what they did over the course mostly of the first 80 something games they'll definitely have a good chance to win tonight and then maybe they can carry that over onto the road but i guess i don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves um they can just win tonight and yeah. get to wednesday that will be a good first step see what happens that's your mike and offer give him a follow jim underscore i can offer and of course new orleans pelicans.com see you tonight sir see you guys thanks for listening to the new orleans pelicans podcast Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.